I'm really grateful again this morning to, to Tony and to everybody who serves to teach our kids the gospel. I hope we're doing it at home. I hope our kids are seeing in our own lives, uh, whether we have kids or not, but whether the, the people of our church are showing them examples of what it looks like to trust in Jesus and what it looks like to repent of sin. I hope that's happening all the time, but I love that we get to teach them more focusedly, if that's a word, on Sundays. Um, if I haven't gotten to meet you yet, my name is Christian. I get to serve as one of our elders, and I'm so grateful now to be the one who reads the Word of God to us. And so as we continue through this series in the Gospel of Matthew, if you have a copy of the Bible, open it up, or, or if it's on your phone, turn it on. Uh, let's together look at Matthew chapter 9. We'll look at the tail end of, Ma- of Matthew 9, and then we'll read all of chapter 10. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. Listen really carefully, because this is the Word of God. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but... Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who's worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone won't receive you or listen to your words, Shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, don't be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it's not you who speak but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. 
if they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, which means lord of demons, how much more will they malign those of his household? So, have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You're of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who's in heaven. Don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever doesn't take his cross and follow me isn't worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he's a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Father, Son, and Spirit, make us hear these things with faith. Make us believe them. Make us believe and love and hope in such a way that our lives this morning and the rest of our lives would be changed. God, you are powerful and you are so full of love. And so please make me speak the truth and make us hear with faith. Jesus, you are our master, so we sit at your feet. Help us to love you and obey you in your own name and for your greater glory in this world. Amen. Let's just get right to it. You and I live in a little bit of a different context than these apostles, right? The apostle, that that word that means somebody who is sent out. We are not the 12. You and I are not called to be like these particular 12 men. We are not called to go to this little nation about the size of South Carolina in the Middle East. Even if we were, our cultures are so very different. We are not the apostles, but... Brothers and sisters, you and I have the same mission to announce this kingdom of God that has come to anybody, to anybody who will accept and follow this Christ. That's really all I want to say this morning. It's, it's really simple, but I want, I want myself and I want you to take this to heart. Jesus still wants our neighbors to follow him. And so he sends us to tell them about the kingdom. It's that important. I'll I'll, I'll say it again. Jesus still wants our neighbors to follow him, so he sends us to tell them. And in this story, this long passage, we remember that Matthew is broken up into several teaching passages, and after the first one, the Sermon on the Mount, this is numero dos. This is the second big, long teaching section the Lord gives us. And in this teaching passage, where he tells people who trust him and follow him already, he tells us answers. He's a good teacher. He he teaches us what we need to know. And he answers three important questions. 
that you and I and everyone who follows Jesus have got to know three answers to three big questions about what it means to be sent to announce the kingdom of God. The, the first one, really simply, and this is the bulk of what Jesus tells to tell us here, is what are we supposed to do? Uh, Jesus has sent us out. To do what? Well, really simply, in announcing this coming kingdom that is come, but man, is it going to come in a better way soon. In being sent out, you and I, brothers and sisters, are called to do humble word and service to anybody who will take it. We are to be promiscuous in humbly talking and serving the people around us. That's what we're supposed to do. Again, we are not living in the same context, but this is in the scriptures for us to learn from because we, brothers and sisters, are all sent out to do this work. The apostles here, and many today, are still sent out to do, I don't know, you could call it frontier mission, to go to the front lines. That's exactly what we've sent uh, Zach and Elaine to do in Thailand. That's what we're sending Grayson and Casey to do in East Africa. I, I don't know, I know many of us don't know this. That's why we also support uh, uh, some friends of mine, a, a man named Jesse and his wife Mukadam, who are working with a, a particular group of people who are in the news a lot right now because they're being persecuted by their government. They're uh, victims of genocide. We gave last year to support their work to make the kingdom of God known to those particular people. We send people to do frontline work, even here at OSC. But most of us listening right now, we're not sent to frontier mission. We're, we're kind of doing home mission. We're working because the people around us in Effingham and Savannah, even if they may call themselves followers of Jesus, the kingdom of God has not yet come into their hearts yet. And so we get to serve them. So what are the apostles? What are these frontier missionary people? And what are we on the home mission? What are we supposed to do? I think we could boil Jesus' words down really simply to just two things. We, we take care of what people need physically, and we take care of what they need spiritually. That, that's really what the mission is. It's what the mission's always been. That, even that word mission, we, we use that word in English, it really comes from the Latin word just to be sent. This sent thing that we're on, this mission has never been about, well, do you serve physical needs or do you tell them about the, the gospel? It, 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 if I can say it like this, that never entered Jesus' mind to split it up like that. But, but it enters into our mind all the time, some of it just based on how we're wired and our preferences and personalities. When we only care about physical needs and we ignore the spiritual danger people are in, or when we, we desperately desire for people to be converted to follow Jesus, but we don't give a rip about their physical suffering. When we split up things like that, we are breaking into two pieces something that Jesus always meant to be one. That's what he's sending these people out on to do. That's what the mission is. And when we think of our own lives as doing only one or the other, then, then we're on a mission. It's just not the one that Jesus sends us on. It's, it's just not real. That's what we're supposed to do. And how are we to do it? How, how are the apostles supposed to do that, to to take care of people's physical and spiritual needs. There's a lot of differences between then and now. But the heart is still there. The core of this work is still the same. We announce that God has brought his kingdom, the place where he's the king, where his rules are loved and treasured, and with his help to the best of our abilities, where his rules and laws are obeyed, where he is the king and we love our passport. <laughs> Because we love where we get to live. We announce that. God has done that. And we do it, among other things. Can I, can I put it like this? I, this jumped out to me as I was studying this week. We announce that message by treating unconverted people with humility. Did, 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 you, did you notice in all the instructions Jesus gives, very, I mean, very like brass tacks, practical, okay, as you're going on this like traveling ministry tour, walking from town to town. Did you notice Jesus' instructions about how they are to act? I don't, I don't know that any of us are going to literally sell our homes and just walk around telling people about Jesus. That might be your calling in life. But like, I got bills to pay. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. 
But what we have in common with these apostles is the way we are to treat the people we are sharing the message with. Did, did, you, see, did you see how deadly serious this message is? Did you see how Jesus references the Old Testament story of Sodom and Gomorrah, this place that was destroyed by God in a supernatural way with awful suffering, with fire falling down, with with poisonous gas choking people, with awful suffering. Jesus says the people who do not take the message of the kingdom of God to heart, that when this good and kind God comes again, it will be better for those people. Who, who died painful and awful deaths. It will be better for them than for those who do not listen to the message of Jesus. This is deadly serious. But, how would you communicate, how would you talk about the most important thing in the world that we can say with humility but with confidence, if you disagree with me on this, you are wrong to great peril to yourself. How would you communicate that? Jesus sends these guys out, and in sending them out, he says, also, remember, you will have to crash on their couches and ask them to feed you afterward. You're going to have to hopefully stay in the homes of these people that you're bringing this message to. If I remembered that, if you remembered that, would we do nearly as much name-calling, finger-pointing, bad-mouthing non-Christians. If I then would say, hey, um, do you got like a spare bedroom? And like, do you have stuff to make a sandwich? Because like, you're going to hell and I'm really happy about it, but like, I got to stay somewhere tonight. But if we had that attitude, would that not radically change the way we bring this deadly serious message to the people around us? Because that's exactly what our Lord and our Savior and our kind King has sent us to do. I, I wonder if, if, if you have been changed to that level toward Jesus' character that we see described as kindness and gentleness, goodness, and, and, and self-control. There's a TV show right now that my wife and I are watching, and what, what we really appreciate about the show is the main character is just a genuinely nice guy. He's really, he's really thoughtful to people who live around him. He's very generous toward them. He is thinking about them constantly. He's very encouraging. I don't know if if it's not necessarily a show for everybody by any means, but what what draws me into the show is he's just a likable character. And what makes him likable, he's just a very, can I put it like this, a very good person. And it's disarming because the show is said in the real world that we don't know what to do with someone who's just really kind. We don't trust him, like some of the characters don't trust him. We make fun of him. We, we, we don't really think he's got our best interests at heart. He must be playing some kind of game. We all want really kind and good people in our lives, but when we get them and when we are them toward non-Christians, it gets kind of weird because people don't always know what to do about that, but some people, when, when we come with kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control and everything that the Holy Spirit gives us to make us more like Jesus, some people supernaturally take notice. We, we talked about this story in our equip class that we just wrapped up about the, the kind of first half of church history. Um, the story of a man who becomes one of the most important Christian writers of all time, one of the most important theologians, a guy named Augustine who was a, the equivalent of a college professor, had a common law wife, kids out of wedlock, was a really nice guy, really successful, and he actively hated Jesus. He'd grown up in a Christian house and had intentionally walked away from it. And so he's like a lot of us. Um, once he le- leaves the house um, and kind of is doing his own thing in life, he has the story a lot of us have, which is that he only goes back to church because his mama made him. He's, he starts visiting church with his mom, basically to get his mom off his back. And the, the pastor who's there, a man who later becomes famous himself, a man by the name of Ambrose. Ambrose, in retrospect, changed Augustine's life. And here's how Augustine described that relationship to this guy who, who brought him the gospel, the, the message that the kingdom of God had come. In his autobiography, he says, I began to love him. At first, not as a teacher of the truth, for I had quite despaired of finding the truth in the church. But simply 
as a man who was kind and generous to me. Not everyone's Augustine. Not everyone's called to be Augustine. But can you, can you see this, brothers and sisters, that someone whose, whose life, whose teaching affects us today and what we believe at one Savior and what it means to be a Christian in our time, this guy only becomes a Christian because another person who brought the message to him was kind and was generous to him. Because we listen to people we love. And we love people who really care about us. People who are humble. People who give us what we need. And so brothers and sisters, just to take a moment of application here, pause. As we think about this mission that Jesus has sent us on, we're, we're not living in Israel, but we are living in Effingham. The people that we work with in Effingham or Chatham or beyond, ask yourself, do you and do I, do we need to apologize to anybody? Do we need to ask forgiveness from an unconverted person? Because we've failed them. We, we've, maybe we've failed to show what Augustine called kindness and generosity. We, we have not been nice to them. We've been cruel and harsh, unbiblically stern. We, do we need to go apologize to someone and say, listen, I, I've been a jerk to you. Or maybe slightly better, but not a lot. I haven't really like, helped you. And I knew you needed help, but I, I just didn't do it. Do we need to apologize to somebody for that? And do we need to apologize maybe even more, more difficult? Um, do we need to apologize to a non-Christian person we know because we haven't told them the truth? I, on vacation, I spent, um, I spent last weekend with uh, a group of uh, five other guys that I've been friends with since high school. We get together every year. Um, I'm the only Christian in the group. Um, I became a Christian at the end of high school, and these guys have continued down different paths, and I love them. They're some of my oldest friends. and um, I don't know if you have relationships like this within your life, but, but as it, it came up that, you know, what do you do for work? What do you do for work? What do you do for work? You're a Baptist minister. Like, it's kind of unavoidable to some extent. I had to apologize to these guys. Um, it, it, it led to some really fruitful conversations I was so grateful to have, but it, it, it led me to do what I might be difficult for you to do too. I have to ad admit, like, I believe something that if I'm right, you are in terrible danger. And we've known each other for 25, 30 years. Um, we've talked about it some, but I don't think I've given you the right impression of the truth. And, and, and so would, would you forgive me? That, that was a difficult conversation I had to have. Maybe we need to apologize, though, and then do the right thing in repentance. And maybe that's not you. Maybe, maybe there's no one you need to apologize to. Maybe not. Let me encourage you, then, to do what I found in my own study of Scripture, to pray a very simple prayer. In as many words, Lord, I know you've sent me to the people around me. I know that. This is not the only passage of Scripture that shows that, but I know it. I am sent. Please, please show me. Who am I supposed to serve? And who am I supposed to talk to? I spent the last year meditating on the letter to the Ephesians, and it strikes me so powerfully that at the end of this letter, Paul writes to this church. He's already sent to a faraway place. He's actually in prison in a faraway city because he's been sent out. Like, he is that frontier mission guy that most of us aren't and never will be. And, and he's done everything. Like, you couldn't get more sent, obviously, than Paul was obviously sent. And he tells these Christians so many things, he encourages them, but then at the end of the letter he asks in Ephesians chapter 6, pray for me. Pray that the Lord would open opportunities for me. Pray, pray that the Lord would help me to speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I think like, if we were talking to Paul, all of us would just quickly call a time out and say, Paul, like, <laughs> dude, you don't get more bold than you are. You're in a faraway city where literally no one has heard about Jesus, it seems like. Everything around you is an opportunity. Just do it. But Paul says there's some spiritual stuff going on that even he doesn't really grasp. He's not in control of it. So he says, pray for me that I would have opportunities. Let's be a group of brothers and sisters. Let's be a family at OSC who are praying for ourselves and for others. God, open up opportunities. Because I can talk to him blue into the face with some people, and maybe some of us know that experience. I feel like we've been over this a thousand times, and it just doesn't seem to, to take. 
pray that this good and kind God who has sent us out to humbly serve people physically and spiritually, pray that he would show us who really needs it most, who can do some of that Christian supernatural triage, who's first in line for me. Pray that prayer. It's easy for me to say that, but, but if I'm being really vulnerable, a lot of us, and including myself, we know exactly what we're supposed to do. I've been a Christian long enough. I understand exactly what Jesus means when he talks about being sent out to, to talk about the kingdom of God, to proclaim it. That's the word that's used most often in this passage. It's repeated several times. Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. I know I'm supposed to proclaim. I'm just really cruddy at it. So that's what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. I don't, I don't know if I'm the only one here who's like that, but you know what you're supposed to do. But you and I feel a real anxiety about doing it because some of us know that when we talk about the kingdom of God we have we have entered into the sea of awkward and I'm not super good at swimming in the sea of awkward no matter how well we explain it and so so we could we could nod along because we if if you're a Christian and you know this stuff already you know this is the, the truth you know this is the right answer but how do you get over how awkward this is? Doesn't Jesus understand that this is making us do something awkward? And, and as he makes it clear here, doesn't he know how dangerous this is for some of us? And yeah, so Jesus very honestly and clearly tells us what to do. But secondly, he sends us out. And in doing so, he tells us what we can expect. We're sent out to humbly do word and service ministry to people around us, but we can expect, to, to boil it down to this, we can expect to be treated exactly like Jesus was treated. I, I, don't know if you, I don't know what you think about Jesus this morning. I don't know if you follow him. I don't know if you're just going through the motions. I don't know if you're all in on him and you're passionate this morning. But can I just encourage you, whoever you are, Jesus does not bait and switch people. He doesn't hang a carrot out in front of you to get you to do something and then pull it back. He, he, he tells the truth. He doesn't soft sell us. We have a really honest master. The God who loves you and has come for you does not withhold what you need to know. And, and in this passage, maybe this is what jumps out to you as well. Is it not amazing the kind of stuff Jesus tells these people to expect, to anticipate? He, he warns, I, I love this, there are three things in this passage Jesus says to watch out for. He says, watch out for your own family. He says, watch out for other people. And then in verse 22, he says, watch out for everybody. You will be hated by all, by everybody, for my name's sake. And that's what you call comprehensive. Watch out for everybody. Now, don't just watch out about being bad-talked online or about being poor-mouthed behind your back. That is way down the list of priorities for Jesus. When he sends people out, he says, okay, just, just know that you really might go to prison for this. Just, hey, he fair heads up, um, they really might torture you. That's, what, that's, what I meant, that's, that's what's meant by the word flog. They, might, they really might um, take your shirt off and beat you over the back until you bleed a lot. They really might... Just, just FYI, they really might kill you. I don't, I'm not really good at staying not bent out of shape. I'm really good at being bent out of shape. I think you and I would be helped to not get bent out of shape if we realized that I have never once in my life knowingly been in danger of that for the sake of Jesus. If I have ever been in danger of being arrested, it's because I was being dumb. Not because I was being sent out to proclaim this incredible message. If, if God were not extraordinarily and historically graciously kind in our time right now, this, this would be normal to us. The, the average Christian across all times and all places in the world knows exactly what this is like. Prison time, torture, death, rejection from family, exclusion from family, losing inheritances, losing job opportunities, being denied an education. That's the average Christian life from the average Christian around the world. We are tremendously blessed. Our ultimate expectation, boil it all down again, our ultimate expectation 
is to be treated like Jesus was treated. That's what he says in verses 24 and 25. A a disciple's not above his teacher. A servant's not above his master. It's it's enough. This is our goal. This is our expectation. This is what we're in this for. I want to be treated. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant to be like his master. And then Jesus just brings logic to bear. He says, if they called me, if they called the master of the house, the Lord of demons, I think they're going to treat you. I have been so helped by this illustration in my life in thinking about the, the awkwardness and the hardship of talking to people about Jesus. Not, not just that, but the sufferings we go through and maybe, maybe the unique sufferings we go through that we could miss if we didn't follow Jesus. I've been so helped to imagine life as if it were shaped like a fish hook. Ooh. I have been so helped to realize that becoming like Jesus, living his life, walking in his footsteps after him, including in obedience like this, it really is like a fish hook. Brothers and sisters, you and I are so hell-bent, I mean that literally, we are hell-bent on going from the, the tip of the hook to the top of the hook and bypassing that downward turn. We don't like our lives going down into sadness and depression into affliction and suffering. We don't like that at all. And so we, in our own minds and hearts, we are obsessed most of the time with figuring out how we can follow Jesus but skip out on the suffering. Skip out on the awkwardness. Just skip that down dip of the fish hook and just go straight to the top. Jesus is a truth-telling master. We just don't get to do that and still follow Jesus. It's, it's never looked like that. It, it's certainly not looked like that in our master's life. What was his life? It was a life of rejection, of awkwardness within his own family and with the people he served and with literally everybody, even his own disciples, especially the one who betrayed him. Life was a fish hook that took him deeper and deeper into unfair, unasked for suffering. And then he rose from the dead. And then he ascended to heaven. And now he's ruling again at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is not a man of sorrow anymore. He is a man of joy. Jesus currently enjoys what he has promised to us and what we so desperately want. He got there. We just don't get to follow him. I mean, literally, we don't get to follow him and end up where he has ended up if we are not bracing ourselves to go down, to follow the bottom of that hook. That's really not a fun message. That, that's not something I can easily, like emotionally whip you up into believing. Uh, I, I, I love old hymns. Y'all know that. I'm a crotchety old man who loves old music. But there's one hymn that I do not appreciate um, that talks about the experience of following Jesus and it and includes the line that you sing over and over again, and now I am happy all the day. Jesus is is a joyful man who gives his Holy Spirit to encourage us and to give us constant joy. I don't know that the average Christian life is meant to be able to be described as, and now I am happy all the day. But what I do know is this. Jesus gives very practical encouragement in this passage. For people who are doing this, who are, for better or for worse, like they're holding their nose and they're cannonballing cannonballing into the sea of awkward. (laughs) I don't know what this is going to look like, Jesus, but I just want to do what you want me to do. And so in, starting in verse 26, he has a, a series here. I, I count four. I count four things, he says, to encourage us in doing this. I love this description that ends in, in 25, verse 25, where he's just laying it all out about how painful and difficult this is going to be. And then in verse 26, he says, so have no fear of them. What kind, of, like, what kind of corner did we just turn here, Jesus? This is not, like, should I not be incredibly afraid of them at this point because of what you just said? He says, no, therefore, don't be afraid, not of them. In verse 26, he says that, and, and, and how can he say that? Well, because in verse 27, he says, no matter if you are sharing the gospel, if you are serving people who don't appreciate it for the sake of Jesus, first, in verse 27, No matter how badly you're misrepresented, no matter how badly people talk about Christians or the church, no matter how badly lies are spread about you, Jesus, in as many words, says that the truth will out one day. 
that the, 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 the kindnesses and the love that we show to people in trying to bring the kingdom of God to them, we will be misrepresented for what feels to us like a long time. But in eternity, the light will get shown into all the dark places, and the truth will be known. So, if you're lied about and you're misrepresented, it won't be like that forever. Secondly, verse 28. Jesus is just a very brass tacks, practical, pragmatic guy. He says you can choose to be afraid of two things. You can be afraid of uh, losing your life, which is already so temporary, so finite. You can lose that and then live forever in this kingdom with a father, with me, with a Holy Spirit, with a, a community and a world of people who have been changed forever. Option one. Or option two, you can hold on to what you've got. You, you, you can keep it. You, God in his kindness will in the most severe and kind judgment, God will sometimes let us have exactly what we want. We'll hold on to this life that's free from, from suffering for Jesus' sake. We'll, 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 we're, we're clinging to being comfortable and, and not suffering, and God will sometimes let us have exactly that. We will not lose this life. We will find exactly what we might want. But in the judgment, we will lose everything. And Jesus says, between those two options, pick the first one. Pick, pick the one that, that leads you to lose your life in this world and get everything. Because it, it just pragmatically makes sense. It's got the better long-term return on investment. And thirdly, verses 29 to 31, Jesus says very simply, no one can hurt you so bad that God will stop loving you. He cares about birds. He cares, he cares about birds that die. And the old philosophy joke, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it actually fall? God says, yeah, there are birds that fall and no one is around and it doesn't happen unless I permit it. I love you so much more than stupid birds that I love. And if, if God loves you like that, what, what Paul will later say in Romans 8, how could anything separate us from the love of Christ? The love of God that's in Christ. God loves you too much to let your suffering be worthless and pointless. And then he ends this teaching in verses 40 to 42. He says that God holds you and I in such high regard. He treasures you and me so much that when he wants to spread his kingdom, when he wants more people to get in on this that we have found ourselves in and that he has created and sent, he treasures us as his messengers so much that the way people treat us in bringing the kingdom to them is how they are treating God himself. You remember the story of the Apostle Paul being converted about how he literally gets knocked flat on his rear end by the Lord Jesus who appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was not persecuting Jesus. He was throwing Christians in prison. He hated them. But Jesus is, I think, referencing a, a passage in the prophet Zephaniah where God says, those who oppose you poke me in the apple of my eye. When you spread the message of good news to all people and they ignore you or they mock you or they hate you or they throw you in prison or they kill you, God takes that very personally. And that should encourage us to brace ourselves. Because we're not wrong to think that people will get mad at us if we share this message with them. Even if we do it humbly and kindly, even if we meet all their physical needs, even if we are the perfect, nicest people, the, the clearest teachers and explainers who ever existed, even if we buy, if we go all in on this very expensive to us mission, they may still kill us just like they did the first one who went out with this message. Just like they, they did to the one that is ruling over this kingdom right now. Just like they did to the one that we love and our lives have been changed by. If they treated Jesus like that, they will treat us like that. We are wrong if we naively think that won't happen to us. But we are more wrong if we think it's not worth it. 
if we think that the suffering in this world negates that, the goodness of going on mission and bringing this message and bringing service to people around us, to, to be treated like Jesus by being mocked and ignored and rejected, even killed, that's what the world does to us. To be treated like Jesus is a scary prospect if we think we're only being treated like, treated like Jesus by people. But what if God treated you like he treats Jesus? What if on the, the other side of this downward fish hook there is joy and peace and relief? What if there is glory? What if there's life that never ends? What if there is visible face-to-face relationship with the God who made all things? To be treated like Jesus by people was awful. It seems like the hell of hells, but to be treated like Jesus by God. My, I come from a coal mining family. I grew up in the mountains. Um, people on both sides of my family have mined coal and have gone down those elevators deep into the darkness for not just days and years, but for generations. Imagine two coal miners on the same elevator shaft going down every day and coming back up filthy and broken, doing a job that will eventually kill them. What if one of those coal miners knew that he's going to get paid 30000 a year to do that? And the other coal miner, standing right next to him, knew that he was getting paid $2 million a year to do this. It's equally painful for them both. It will lead to both of them dying. Isn't their experience of doing it way different? If you knew that you were going to be rewarded like that for doing this truly dangerous thing, would that not affect the way you mind coal? Does it not change everything for us to know that we are doing something that we do not get out of alive, and will likely make life much more difficult in the meantime. But on the other end of it, the payout is so great, you'd be a fool not to do it. It would be the stupidest thing you've ever done. So, brothers and sisters, let's you and me, let's go down in the darkness. Let's, let's do the hard, the backbreaking thing. Let's do the thing that makes some relationships in this life, in Jesus' church, and breaks many others. Because we will be rejected like Jesus was rejected. Brothers and sisters, let's be people who endure to the end and are saved in doing this kind of work. Let's be people who share the good news of the kingdom, take it on the jaw, and do it again tomorrow. Because we will be treated like Jesus for the worse, but so much for the better. That, that's, what it, that's what it looks like. That's what we can expect Point two, when we, point one, do what Jesus is telling us. That's the experience of it. I don't care who's preaching to you. I am not a tremendous preacher. If I were, I could not hype us up enough to do that painful of work for the rest of our lives. No Sunday experience, no good, accurate Bible teaching, no emotional experience that you could experience at a church, nothing could fill up your tank anywhere near enough to actually do what Jesus wants us to do. If we didn't understand why we were doing it. And not just understand why we're doing it, but have a real heart-level motivation. No one is able to do this unless there is something more powerful than our natural and good sense of self-preservation. I don't want people to hate me. I don't, want to, I don't want my family to experience hardship and suffering because of doing this. It would be so much easier to kind of check all the boxes and, and sort of follow Jesus. But between him and me, he knows that I'm not in this at all. None of us could do this unless we knew why we were doing it. And that's the last thing I want to say this morning. Why do we do this? I think it's because of the way this passage starts and the way that this passage ends. Look at the end of chapter 9. Look at verse 35. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom 
and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are so very few. So, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And look at the end. I, I, I didn't read this verse, but man, I wish 1,200 years after this actually happened, when we added chapter divisions to the Bible, man, I wish that we had bumped chapter 10 back one verse. Because look at, look at chapter 11, verse 1. This is immediately what happens after Jesus gives these instructions. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. In my life, the greatest danger, the greatest hindrance to me bringing the message of the kingdom to people is not anxiety about consequences. And it's not a lack of understanding because I don't know what I'm supposed to say and do. I just plain don't care enough. One of my great sins, and maybe yours too, one of my great sins is apathy. I, I wish it didn't sound so bad, but it, to be very honest, my great sin and the great objection for me to obeying Jesus here, I just don't care enough about the people around me to do it. Not consistently, not like I ought to. I don't care about people who might end up outside the kingdom and all of that means. In my better moments, Jesus has changed me. But I think you and I have some not better moments, don't we? What is the only thing that is able to break through a lack of love and a lack of concern? It's a stronger love. It is a love that is more compassionate than my lack of compassion. And it's a, it's a love that has to change me and work through me and come from outside me because I am jacked up. You can I say this with great love, brothers and sisters? So are we all. Very simply, the only thing that can make people go out and share this message is the love of Jesus working against us and in us and through us and by us. His love has to inspire us. His love has to model everything for us. His love has to change us. And what we see in this passage and throughout the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus is not a bad boss who sends people lower on the totem pole to do work he doesn't want to do himself. Jesus sends the apostles and Jesus sends us. He sends us out to do nothing more than what he did. To proclaim the Gospel of the Kingdom in word and in deed. And, and what did we see in 11.1? 1? What does Jesus do as soon as he finishes giving these instructions? He goes back to doing it himself. Can I invite us all, myself too, to open our hearts and our minds again, maybe for the first time all week, maybe for the first time in your life. Can I invite us to be open to the love of God? Would we willingly choose heartbreak and pain and eventually death to bring the kingdom to other people like Jesus did for us. Because he did not snap his fingers to magically make the kingdom come to you and to me. He did it through our parents or our grandparents. He did it through other people at the church we had to go to because mom and dad didn't give us an option. He did it through pastors. He did it through Sunday school teachers. Who did it? He did it through other family members. He did it through friends. He did it through people we never talked to again. Jesus has brought the kingdom to people personally. And he, he's custom-tailored you in your life circumstances to bring the same kingdom to people. Jesus wants our neighbors to come into God's kingdom so badly that he gave them the only message that could do it and he gave them the person he wants to bring them the message. He gave them you. 
I, I can't I can't wordsmith this well enough to change your heart, but Jesus in his love can. Would you be open to him, changing your heart and mind? I I love the story, and this is where we'll close. I love the story of a man who died in 1998, a British, you know he's British because he's got a girl's name for his first name. I love the story of a man named Leslie Newbigin, who became a Christian when he was in college, did not grow up in a Christian house at all, attended Cambridge University, became a Christian, and left everything as a young man to move to India and to serve the poor and to preach the gospel to them. And he lived his entire adult life in India, nearly 40 years before he retired and he came back to England. And in the time that he was gone, he said England had changed. He bought a house and lived there with his family, but none of his neighbors were Christians. Well, they were Christians on paper, but none of them followed Jesus. And so he devoted the rest of his retired life to training average, ordinary Christians about how to share the gospel. Because he'd lived in a culture like India for so long, he said he came back. England was much more like India than he'd expected. I I wish you would read all of his books. They're they're written for average people like us who didn't go to seminary, but who followed Jesus. I, I wish you would read everything he has to say, but this line, I wish it were stamped on the back of my eyelids. I love this. The deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is. On the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped reign of the devil. If you've been changed by the love of Jesus, you just want to hang out with him. You want to be in the room with him. You want to to know his presence. And if you want to find Jesus, his, his body is at the right hand of the Father. He's ruling over all things. But through the spirit that he has sent into the world, where is Jesus? He is in that space between you and someone you know who doesn't follow Jesus yet. And so go to Jesus there. And do what Jesus is already doing, where he's already prepared the groundwork. Let's be people who love with our hands and who love with our words. That's exactly what we do when we come to the table every week. It's exactly what we are remembering, that this Jesus loved us through his good teaching and and revealing stuff to us we never would have known otherwise. And by dying for us and by being raised for us, And by returning to the Father's right hand, we celebrate this at the table, a God who loves us humbly through word and deed, through years, through decades of humiliation and suffering until the end. And then on the other side was life because he loves us that much. So if if you follow this Jesus, you and I need the spirit of Jesus to give us faith that we could feed on this Jesus by faith, like he says, that we could serve the same Father that Jesus served by loving the neighbors he's put around us. If we trust in Jesus, then every time we take this supper, we are strengthening our souls to do his work. If if you belong to him, if you trust in him and have been baptized into his name, then please let me ask you in in a moment to come forward down the center aisle while the band is playing a song at any point, take a, a, the little thimble cup and return to your seat so that after we finish singing the song, we'll take and we'll celebrate this loving Jesus together. Pray with me. Father, Son, and Spirit, this is your word. This is you. And we long to be where you are. But we are so weak. We are ignorant. We are arrogant. We can do nothing apart from you, Jesus. And so we we don't come to the table with anything. We don't come to your word with anything except brokenness and sin and hypocrisy. But we, we, we see your open hand. We see your willingness to love us, to change us. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, come. Come and help us. Fill us that the people around us might be filled. Bring your kingdom to us again and again and again so that we could bring it to others. Equip us to be where you are, Jesus to bring your kingdom as weak and broken as we are to the people around us who so desperately need you. Do this through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.